Okay, thank you very much for having me and thanks for coming. This is uh, joint work with uh, Viral Acharya and uh, Tarun Ramadurai at NYU and Oxford, uh, respectively. Um, so we've been working for quite some while actually in trying to understand some uh, properties of commodity futures return. And so just to set the stage a little bit, think uh, in terms of asset allocation now. Um, historically, if you had put together an equal weighted index of commodity futures, you had fully collateralized it, uh, and you have uh, invested in this index, you know, you roll over the futures, uh, you would have obtained historically a sharp ratio, which is at the same level as you do for the stock market. Uh, so that's fine, right? Uh, however, there are a couple of things. Uh, returns are negatively, and this index is, are negatively correlated with uh, equities, stock market returns. So take a very simple model, the CAPM. Uh, if the negatively correlated returns, uh, you would have a negative beta, so you should have a negative sharp ratio, you should have a negative risk premium. You don't see that, so that's kind of odd. And the second thing is that there's quite a bit of time variation expected returns or the risk premium in commodity markets related in part to what's called the roll yield. And that, that doesn't seem to be very related to what's going on in time duration returns in equity markets. So uh, you can imagine that these have been sort of great selling points for people doing commodity index funds or commodity funds in general because you have diversification and high returns, right? And so we've seen just a bunch of money the last 10 years coming into these types of funds. And in fact, some people have argued that the speculative activity has been part of driving not only risk premium, but also the spot price, right? And so that's basically what we're going to think about. We're going to think about what drives the level and dynamics of the risk premium of commodity futures, right? And also, can it impact spot prices? Why does the activity in the futures market uh, relate to spot prices, right? And so in, we know it's not a market beta, and it's not standard predictors of equity returns. It's something else, and our story is going to be the following. Our story is going to be that there's market segmentation between commodity markets and equity markets, meaning that the players that are marginal in the commodity markets are not exactly the same as those that are marginal in the equity market. In particular, we're going to think that the producers of commodities which are uh, short the futures are putting some price pressure on uh, the futures price. So if a lot of producers want to hedge, they go short the futures contract, pushing the price down, creating a higher risk premium, unless there's a lot of our capital on the other side that's willing to take that exposure. And so we're going to argue that really it's about a lot of the variation in risk premium in this market is going to be due to those kind of forces. So to show you a little plot here, this is basically uh, from 85 till today, uh, the uh, impacts of producer hedging pressure on commodity futures on the commodity futures risk premium, which is this uh, blue line versus arbitrage capital in that market. And so you don't have to think too much about what each of these lines exactly mean. I've normalized them so things look nice. What this means is the following. So if you think about this point here, so here you see that the covariance between the, or the so the relation between the uh, futures risk premium and hedging pressure is very high over here. When does that happen? Well, that tends to happen when there is little arbitrage capital. So when there aren't a lot of people on the other side, hedging uh, by producers are pushing prices very heavily. If there's a lot of arb capital on the other hand, like for instance over here, there's lots of arbitrage capital in the market, then if producers want to hedge, they don't move prices much. And that's sort of the core of the story, okay? so. <clears throat> This notion that arbitrageurs have limited amount of capital, we call limits to arbitrage in uh, financial economics. And we can ask some questions whether the corporate hedging policy impacts prices. Does it change producer hedging behavior? And does it affect spot prices? Okay, And so that's sort of uh, where we're going with this. So let me just show you uh, a very simple model. So there's, some, there's some plots here. There's investors at the end, okay? These are guys that invest in equities and everything. There's a producing firm and there's a spot market. They produce, for instance, crude oil. They put it to the spot market and the investors, consumers, we have used gas, we use this guy. Um, if the manager of that firm wants to hedge, for instance, because to hedge their default risk, maybe they're afraid of losing their job upon default, you go to the futures market. You would go short if you're a uh, producer in the futures market. Who's going to be on the other side of that futures market? Well, in standard sort of economic theories, it would just be all investors. Okay, so think about this now. If all if investors as a group own the producing <coughs> firm because they're equity financed, and they're also on the other side of the futures market, they're not going to care about this hedging pressure because they're going to, at the end of the day, end own all the positions. They're not going to care about it. So that's what you get from a standard setup. What we think of is that actually there's an intermediary in this market. So think about commodity trading advisors or hedge funds. 
These guys have local risk constraints, like a VAR constraint or some reason why they can't necessarily take on all the risk. And they're going to demand a little fee. Okay? They're going to say, I'm going to take the long position. I'm a, I'm a CTA or a hedge fund. I'm going to take the long position against the short, but you have to pay me a little extra. Makes sense, right? Um, now, if they do that, it's going to be costly for this guy to hedge. So if you're a producer, you go into the market, you say, okay, if I, if I want to hedge, it's going to be price pressure. It's going to cost me something. What are you going to do if it's costly to hedge? You're going to hedge the same amount as you did before? Well, probably not. You're going to scale down a little bit. If you scale down on your hedging, then you're saying, okay, now I'm not as hedged as I used to be. Do you want to hold the same amount of inventory? Maybe not. Maybe you want to scale down on the inventory, release some of the inventory to the market. If you release inventory to the market, what's going to happen to the spot price? It goes up, right? So now you see that there's a link between how much capital these intermediaries have and producers hedging demand and the spot price. In particular, if this becomes more costly uh, to hedge through this channel, spot prices would actually go up. If it becomes less costly, tons of money flows into the market, you can put more forward. If you hold more inventory, um, this is going to have the opposite effect and spot prices go up. Okay? So if top prices go down, if you release them into the market, otherwise go up. So that's our story, right? So, <clears throat> so anyway, in the paper we do tons of stuff. One, you might not be so interested in, we write up an equilibrium model. Two is more interesting to you, I would think. We do empirical analysis and we so show this effect being in the data. Basically, we say that producer default risk is driving manager's desire to hedge. So. If you're about to, if you're more default risk, you're worried about uh, losing your job, for instance, you might want to hedge so you don't uh, have as much of a uh, probability of, of going default. So anyway, we look at the U.S. crude oil, heating oil, gasoline, and natural gas commodity market. And so now, we're going to remember one thing. On average, if the amount of, de of default risk among producers as a whole within that commodity, if that goes up by one standard deviation in sort of historical terms, the quarterly futures risk premium goes up by 4%. So that's a 4% increase in the risk premium for a quarter. If you multiply that by 4, we get 16 for a year, right? Huge effect. And what we're going to show is that that effect is bigger if there's less arbitrage capital and smaller, in fact, zero if there's lots of arbitrage capital in the market. So <clears throat> here's the story again. Uh, there's some plots here. This is from the model, but um, let's just make sure you remember it. If you increase the producer hedging demand, which is over here, the risk premium goes up. If you uh, decrease speculators' capital uh, amount of capital, the futures risk premium goes up. Those two things are going to make it costlier to hedge. If it's costlier to hedge, you hold less inventory. Bring inventory to the market, spot prices, uh, inventory goes, goes down, spot prices today goes down, and they go up in the future. Okay? So I know there's a couple of steps to the story, but you know, uh, you can trust me or read the paper. So what we're going to show is uh, we have lots of tables. I'm not going to show you that. We have firm level and aggregate evidence that producers' hedging behavior is related to default risk. It's kind of our story. Uh, we construct commodity sector for each, for crude oil, for heating oil, for gasoline, for natural gas. We look at the producers. We create uh, commodity-specific measures of this default risk. And we do lots of other sort of robustness things that we have to worry about uh, to make sure we get the right uh, identification of our results. So <clears throat> here's how we do this. So this is, by the way, if you want to think about a trading strategy and risk premium, you want to run something called forecasting regressions. And our model is telling us that the risk premium is related to stuff that's, think of this as the beta, and also an industry-specific components related to idiosyncratic risk and the risk preferences of uh, ARBs, and that's because that's a market segmentation. Now, how do we test it? So, <clears throat> point two you should take away. If you want to find time variation and risk premia, you run what's called uh, forecasting regression, return forecasting regressions. You take the returns next quarter from, you know, let's say today to the next quarter here, historically speaking, and you regress it on the lagged level of default risk, which is our measure, and then some controls for other stuff. Now, if this beta is, is positive, that means that if default risk goes up, the expected returns go up. Because this is the realized return. There's an error here. If I take the expectation, it's just this component here. Okay? No error. 
And what we show is that on average, for in the crude oil, it's almost a 6% response. Gasoline is about 4%, natural gas is 6%, everything is significant. If you do everything together, it's about 4.6% per quarter response to this capital, uh, this, this default risk variable. How much time do I have? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Oh my goodness, let's go back. Um, <clears throat> so that's one part of our story, okay? That just says that unconditionally, if producers want to hedge more, they're pushing the risk premium. And that's related to producer default risk. Part two is what about ARBs? Okay, we need some measure of the amount of capital ARBs have. So that's, that would be you in the future, okay? You're in there in the hedge fund uh, and you can see you know, how much access to capital do you have? Uh, are risk limits being increased if you're in a bank maybe? Uh, or are they being decreased and so it's hard for you to take risk? And so we're gonna rely on some other people uh, in, the, in the literature and use a measure which is growth in broker-dealer assets relative to household assets. Just, you know, how much money is flowing into the broker-dealer sector? We also have used another measure, which is commodity-specific, which is how much money is flowing into commodity funds relative to the size of the rest of the economy. If there's tons of money flowing in, then these guys have ample capital. <coughs> now things become complicated. Now we're going to run a re regression here where, again, we have next quarter's futures return on the left-hand side, and we regress it on lagged measures of broker-dealer assets. Remember, when broker-dealer assets are high, right, then there's lots of ARB capital. What's going to happen to the risk premium on commodity futures, do you think, if there's lots of arbitrage capital, and this typically goes on the long side, right? It's going to go down. Think about what's happened to expected returns when hedge funds and banks have lots of capital. Expected returns, risk premium go down because you're willing to take more risk. So that's over here. What about default risk? Default risk is still significant now, it's at 3.2%. So it's a little bit lower than it used to be. And then we have an interaction term. The multiplication of broker-dealer times default risk. So what's the intuition for that? The intuition is as follows, okay? Is the effect of default risk higher or lower if broker-dealer measure is high or low, okay? So think about the case where broker dealers have tons of capital. So this is a positive number. Let's make it plus one. I normalized it. Here's 3.2% per quarter. If this is plus one, I take 3.2, I subtract 2.8, and I get 0.04%, okay? That means that if broker dealers have lots of capital, if producers want to hedge, it doesn't matter for risk premium. If, however, broker dealers has little capital, minus one, I change the sign here, and now the impact of, of default risk or producer hedging goes from 3.2 to 3.2 plus 2.8 is 6, 6%. So you see it varies between zero and 6% <coughs> quarterly depending on uh, uh, arbitrage uh, capital and how much these guys want to hedge. Okay, and so that's basically <coughs> The gist of our story, um, what we do in the paper is we show also that this in impacts inventory in particular in the way I said that if it becomes more costly to hedge, people are going to let some inventory go. And so what this graph is showing, the, the regression I showed you is sort of giving you statistical evidence, but it's not maybe as intuitive. Here I just show at an annual level, this is from quarterly regressions, but if I annualize stuff by taking sums over years, I can show that the relation between a risk premium and default risk, so just take this as sort of the sensitivity of the two, versus the broker deal capital looks exactly like I showed you. It looks this, like this. It's pretty striking. Correlation is minus 0.5. This is a graph I showed you first. It's this very strong uh, opposite relation. Again, if uh, broker deal capital is ample up here, the effect of producer hedging on the risk premium sensitivity between the two is close to zero. If, like in the recent crisis, broker-dealer assets plummet, there's no risk capacity, what happens if, if producers want to hedge? Well, they're going to drive the risk premium a lot because there's nobody on the other side. Right? And again, this is puzzling from a standpoint of standard financial theory because the producers are equity financed, right? And so if there was just one agent at the back owning the producer firm and owning the uh, futures positions, the long positions, they would sort of be net zero in the futures market and they wouldn't care. But here they do care, okay? 
if you do commodity, uh, or if you think about commodity markets, you may have heard something called the crack spread, right? It's a fantastic name. It's the difference between uh, gasoline and, uh, and, and, and crude oil. Uh, and you can show that the same thing drives variations in the crack spread, okay? Again, if, if oil producers are pushing, and it depends on the broker dealer uh, capital here, and we know that a lot of these hedge funds are actually involved in uh, betting on stuff like the crack spread. So it's the same relation over here. All right, so I'll conclude. <coughs> Basically, the hedging pressure story is old. It's from 1930s by a man called uh, Keynes, right? So uh, the thing about it is that people had a really hard time uncovering this, partly due to bad data and partly due to a lot of finance theory coming later saying that this was not a good argument because if markets are efficient, this shouldn't matter at all. So what we do is we have a refinement where we bring the two together. We just point out that the market segmentation linked through the amount of capital ARBs have uh, is going to be an important component here in understanding it. And so uh, generally speaking, corporate hedging policy does affect asset prices. Uh, it might be obvious to you that it must do that. But you know, if you have studied you know, a PhD in finance, you'll say it's obvious that it does not. And so uh, that's kind of one of the weird things. Thank you, Lori, for laughing at that one. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's basically what we have. Uh, there's tons of other cool results in the paper. And uh, if you want to read it, then let me know. Uh, it does also link to this recent debate. Increased risk appetite of speculators has decreased the cost of hedging. That increases inventory, which increases spot prices. People were arguing that this was happening uh, before the, the, the financial crisis anyway. So thank you.